Welcome to Living Rock Sermon, a place where we bring the transformative power of the Sunday message to your ears. Each week, we bring you a sermon from our most recent service filled with insights, inspiration, and guidance to help us navigate life's challenges and deepen our connection with God. Whether you're joining us from the comfort of your home, on your daily commute, or during a quiet moment of reflection, we are honored to have you as a part of our digital community. Together, we'll embark on a meaningful exploration of faith guided by the wisdom shared from the pulpit. This podcast serves as a bridge, uniting us in a shared experience of worship, reflection, and growth. So get ready to open your hearts and minds as we dive into this week's sermon. I've been speaking the last couple of weeks on what I've been calling the quest of a disciple. We looked the first week at Matthew and his call and how it really does take a call. You know, we don't just sit down and decide, well, I think I'll give Christianity a try. God calls out to us, and uh, we discern that, and then we respond to that. We talked last week about those, the quest of a disciple being walking in the spirit and not walking in the flesh and what that means and how how our mind operates, and how we can even check all boxes and have all, as far as checking the boxes of doctrine or our position on certain things or understanding, but we can still be operating in the flesh. We can still be very carnal in our way about going things. And this week, I wanted, and we talked about that in terms of our identity. This morning, I'm going to speak some more about our identity and talk about significance when it comes to the Bible, many people have this sort of paradigm. I hear it from time to time um, where the Bible, they believe, is a book of heroes um, and that these heroes in the Bible are role models that we should follow and emulate and actually seek to be like them in some way. And we should try to be like Moses. We should try to be like Jeremiah. We should try to be like David. I want to just say this morning, I hope you hear what I mean, and I'll expound on it. Only if we are incredibly proud will we ever think that these heroes can be followed and that we can be like them. That kind of thinking comes from pride. When you and I read the Bible, the first thing you come to grips with which is unlike any other book that's been written that tries to express faith or some form of religion, is that God exposes the weaknesses, the failures, and the faults of all those that he's called. That these are not perfect people by any means. That God continues to work with these people who at times don't even appreciate his grace or even resist his grace. And you wonder, why does God work with these people? Why does God work with Moses after he feels like he can't do anything? His his voice that God can't, that he can't speak for God. Why does God work with a David who who, who commits murder when he's king on the throne and and commits adultery? Or with Jeremiah who said, I'm just a child. God, you you can't use me. Why does God continue to work with these people? Because God is the hero. God is the hero. And God sticks with us no matter what. Every other religion says God's at the top of the ladder and you need to climb your way up. In the Bible, God says, I'm the ladder and I'm coming to you. That's what he, that's what he revealed to Jacob. I'm the ladder. God is the ladder. People in the Bible screw up all the time and yet God never abandons them. They're weak people who need God's salvation at work in their life. And I want you to know this morning, the good news is that God works with people, weak people, and he works through weak people. And that's how he receives the glory. Paul even said himself, we want you to know that the power that is working in us is not of us. Don't look at us. We're nothing. But God, it's God's power. We have treasure in these earthen vessels. And God's working that in our life. 
This is why the the Bible tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because our lives are spent trying to work out this what God has put within us, work out what he's sown in us, even his own spirit when we are born again. So open your Bible this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want to talk about one of the men in the Bible that we know quite well. His story covers several books, and I hope you've got fast fingers or a, a quick cell phone this morning to follow along. But even if you don't follow along with me completely today in all these scriptures, when you get home today or this week, sit down and read 1 Samuel chapter 16 all the way through 2 Samuel chapter 5, and you'll hear this story in its entirety. I'm going to pull out certain things this morning as I want to talk about significance. The background for this text, 1 Samuel 16, 6, is... is uh, God has been very disappointed with Saul as king. God doesn't want Saul to be king anymore. In fact, he's told him he's going to take the kingdom away from him. Samuel had the the, uh, privilege of being able to inform Saul of that. And then God told Samuel that you're to go down into Jesse's house and you're going to anoint a king in place of Saul. So... Samuel is going to offer sacrifice. He invites Jesse's family to join him. And when they came, he looked on Eliab. This is now the prophet Samuel coming to the house of Jesse. And he's looking for a king. And Jesse has gathered his sons before Samuel. And it says, when they came, verse 8, verse 6, he looked on Eliab. Eliab was the oldest. He said, surely the Lord's anointing is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet youngest, or smallest, some translations say. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, sin and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy and had beautiful eyes, was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And notice this verse. Let's read it out loud together. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. You know, I wanted to highlight that text to you this morning, that the Spirit of the Lord rushed on David from that time forward. See, our our challenge in life is to become acquainted with the Holy Spirit that has been placed upon our lives. David had to become acquainted, if you will, with the Holy Spirit that had rushed upon him You know, some people judge their future by their past and where they've come from, where they've been. But God wants us to judge ourselves by the future that he's called us to. We repent of our past. Old things are behind us now. Now everything is before us. And David could be thinking, you know, my daddy didn't think very well of me to even call me into the with the other brothers. Some some build a sermon around that idea that David was the smallest. In fact, some even speculate that that David was the child of another uh, of another mother, according to some Jewish traditions, which is why David says later in the Psalms, "In sin I was conceived." But that's speculation. We don't even have to go there to understand that David was the smallest or the youngest. And all the boys, all his brothers get called to meet the prophet Samuel. This is a big deal. Samuel's coming to the house. But David is left outside. But we don't judge our future by where we've been or by our past. 
but rather by the call of God that's upon us. You see, we believe, I believe, God can do what he says. We just don't sometimes believe that God can do it through us. We believe God can do whatever he is determined to do, but we think he'll use somebody else. We think he's chosen somebody else, but what God has done is he chooses us. You know, when Moses was called and the Lord showed him the burning bush, God did not, I was sharing with the men yesterday in the breakfast, God did not give Moses that spectacle for him to just take photos and, you know, take pictures and kind of look at it from a distance and say, wow, that's really cool. That's something. We need to see more of these burning bushes. No, God provided the spectacle to, for Moses to pursue it. And when God does something outside of ourselves, things that are astound us, things that are wonderful. Like in David's case, the prophet has come to his house. He's anointed him with oil, and the Spirit of God rushed on him. We don't know what that was, what it felt like to David, what it seemed like to him, but the Spirit indicates, the Bible indicates that that's what happened. David now has to pursue what has happened. We're told in the New Testament, what? Seek the kingdom of God. Seek righteousness. We have to pursue these things. They don't just happen. They re it requires a pursuit. God gives us direction as to what he, where he wants us to go. Then we pursue it. It's a quest. You seek it. Why is God speaking to me? You see, when God speaks to you, he has to change your mind about you. And David had to become an under, understand, why me? God doesn't see as man sees prophet told his father men look on the outward appearance God looks on the heart when you and I discover who God has made us to be you will never want to be anybody else David's called to be king yes but it'll take some time before his identity catches up with his assignment and it's true for us too it takes time for who we are in Christ to really catch up with what God's called us to do Anointed by the Spirit. That was his new identity. We know God's ways are not our ways. And we're told, even in the New Testament, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, God's not looking for the strongest. Doesn't look for the smartest. Doesn't look for those who are, are noble. God looks to reveal his glory in us and through us. That's what God wants to do. He wants to reveal his glory in you and through you and reflect his own nature out from you onto the rest of creation. Now, how many know the need to feel significant is a basic human need, which is why rejection is so devastating? David's father, as we said, didn't call him in from the field. Did David feel dejected by that? His older brothers, certainly later on when David goes out to the battlefield to confront the giant Goliath, he didn't really intend to do that, but he was bringing some bread and cheese to his brothers. His oldest brother accused him of having uh, wrong motivations. Are you here just to see a spectacle? <laughs> That's what his older brother said. The problem is not that we need to feel significant, but that we search for it in the wrong places. We get our significance early in life, first of all from our, our parents. Then as teenagers, we look to our peers and then as we age in life, we start looking for our significance and our, and our place in life, from our parents to our peers to our place. And for older people, sometimes that becomes what they're doing, their position in life or their finances in life or where they live or what kind of automobile they drive. But significance can become an obsession, especially in the life of teenagers. And that's become epidemic in our culture today. My wife and I, just watched a, a little Netflix documentary. Maybe some of you have seen it. I don't like to recommend too many things from the pulpit that are television-oriented, but I would recommend this documentary. It's called The Social Dilemma, and it exposes Google, Facebook, Snapchat, Snapchat Pinterest, YouTube, how they exploit, how they're geared. The, these are people who created these systems, created these networks, they've actually come out and said we were, in, we, were, we were doing this knowing we were doing it and it would harm people. We are exploiting people's human beings' needs for significance. That's what they said in the video. 
We're, we're, we're trying to exploit the human need for significance. The only two things they say in this video where people are called users is drugs and these networks, these systems. You're a user. The increase in suicide among the younger generation, middle schoolers who were exposed to these things when they were in middle school in the, in the mid to, uh, 2007, 2008, in that time, suicide has gone up 180% in that people group. Right at the time these things came on the market, 180%. See, the problem with seeking for significance is that we live in a world of other significant seekers who are willing to, in order to establish their own significance, destroy you. Exploit you, which makes us vulnerable to gossip and jealousy and slander and bullying. But for David, David is not a seeking significance. We might think, wow, I'm going to be king. <laughs> David has no idea the kind of man that he's going to have to become to function in that role. The traumas, the dramas, the disappointments, the bloodshed, it'll take its toll on his life. But Samuel, David will become a changed man. For David, significance is not going to be found in a position such as king. But we're told in the Bible, he'll become a man after God's own heart. For God told the prophet, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know the word heart? Your heart is mentioned in the Bible over 900 times. And only God can look at a human heart and see the motivations that are there. God has so designed your heart in a way that it can grow any seed that is sown into it, evil or good. It can grow any seed that is sown into it. Solomon said, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. But I love that verse. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. It rushed on David from that day forward. David had the Spirit rush on him, which would ensure that he would continue to seek after God, even when he would falter. He would always seem to that was a buoyancy because of the Spirit of God in him, like a beach ball you try to push down in a swimming pool. Something within him just won't stay down. Have you figured that out in your own life, that there is something within you of the Lord that just is always resisting you when you're trying to resist him? And he's pushing the other way. Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't think that. <laughs> And he's pushing. David sought the Lord with all his heart. And here's what the book of Acts tells us about David. Acts 13, 22. I have found David, the son of Jesse. Put that up there. Acts 13, 22. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Listen to what it says. He will do anything I want him to do. See, that's a man after God's arm. He'll do anything I want him. This becomes the, the, the significant thing about David's life, not his position as king. What Scripture records is he'll do anything I want him to do. So suddenly, because of this anointing, Samuel, the, 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 the words of Samuel gave to David a whole new identity is thrust upon David, an identity that's found in relationship to God, not his status, not his outward appearance, not a position. And like all of us, it takes time to become self-aware of the significance of the anointing upon our lives. We just don't get it initially. Why Peter tells us in his epistle, 2 Peter 1.10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling an election, sure, 
if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. It's estimated that David was anointed and the Spirit of God rushed upon David when he was between 13 and 16 years old. That's young. Between 13 and 16 years old. But he will not be crowned king until he is 30 years old. That's, what, 16 years? 14 years? Between him being anointed king and the Spirit of God rushing upon him and him actually stepping into the position of being king of Israel? And when David becomes king, according to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 12, turn there, and it says, And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. David finally now, when he's crowned king, look at what it says. David, he perceived well, wait, you didn't perceive it when you slew the giant and you walked into the king's court with the head in your hand? You didn't perceive it then? Well, you, you didn't perceive it when, when you had the opportunity to, to kill Saul and, 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 and with the sword and then another time uh, you, you cut the, the robe off the, the corner of his garment? You didn't perceive that? It was... No, it was 16 years, 14 years before David says that he perceived that the Lord had established him king and that he exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. It's never about human achievement. Our significance is never found in what we can do. As believers, our significance is found in what God can do through us, through our weaknesses, through our troubles, through our trials, through our battles. What happened to David over those 16 years was the shaping of his identity. I believe the number one area that God wants to bring healing to people today in the world, in the church and even outside the church, is to bring healing and wholeness into the area of our identity. There's such confusion today about identity in our world. And our true identity can only be found in Christ. He has to be the one who identifies us and gives us our significance because there's not enough people in the world to help you feel significant. There just aren't. How much affirmation do you need? Will a thousand likes do it? How about maybe, how about maybe 500 thumbs ups? Will that do it for you? Because the same people that are saying this today will say this tomorrow. That's true. But God is always pushing you forward. God is putting, has put his spirit within you to help you understand your significance is in him. And your heart is important. So we have to allow him to work in our heart. Our perceived identity, our value is extremely important if we want to be able to receive the things that God has given to us in the new covenant. But it would appear that many people's perception about David is just caught up in his assignments. Oh, yeah, David, he's a great musician, anointed worshiper, confident leader, warrior, understood authority, loyal. Think of his friendship with Jonathan, brave and courageous. Yeah. That's not any of the things that God calls out. God says, this guy's a man after my own heart. I know he'll do whatever I want him to do. And when David finally came to the place where he perceived he was king, notice what it says he said. That God had exalted his kingdom, listen, for his people's sake. I'll just say this now because you know where I'm going. You've matured in your identity when you know that you're here, not for you, but for others. We mature in our giftings when we realize those gifts are not for us to, 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 to become exhibitionists with. They're not for us to draw attention to our, that God gives us a gift that he might impart and bless others through us. That's a mature identity. So we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now David's first test, his first test 
really comes. Incidentally, he's sent on assignment to bring bread and cheese to his brothers who are on the battle line with Saul. And the Philistines have squared off on one side of a valley, the Valley of Elah, and Saul and his armies are on the other side. And, and it was customary sometimes in order to prevent bloodshed that each side would choose a champion and they would go into the middle and the battle would take place in what we call the in-between. How many battles are always fought in the middle? <laughs> you want to you want to you want to get hurt? Just get in the middle of something. <laughs> just get in the middle. So David said to Saul. So David's first test comes to this drama, and I want to say this right here. And you might want to write this down. Trauma and drama seek to rob us of our identity if we let it. Now, Goliath has been coming out every day, and he's been doing this for 40 days. Which 40 is a number we see often in the Bible that speaks of temptation, testing, trial. Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days. Moses, 40 days. But notice David moving among the people, figuring out what's going on, says, is there not a cause? He's like, why is this happening? So he, word gets to Saul that David wants to, wants, to, wants to fight the battle, and Saul tries to talk him out of it, and he says, listen, you're just a young boy, and this, this, this man has been a, a warrior since he was your age. He's been fighting his whole life. It's been nothing but battles since he was a youth. And here's what David says, 1 Samuel 17, 34. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God." And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Issues concerning our identity are central to us. So Saul told David, you're too young. But then David told Saul his experience as a shepherd. Because shepherding is what David understood. That had been his identity up to that point. Goliath is a warrior. David is a shepherd. And so David leans into his identity as a shepherd, brings forward the experience as a shepherd that he had killed a lion and a lamb, a lion and a bear when a lamb had been taken. David did not do this to protect his own life. He did this to protect a lamb's life. His identity and experience as a shepherd is what helped him defeat Goliath. Because he saw Goliath as just another thief. He saw him just like he saw the lion. He saw him like another robber that had come in to destroy what belonged to God. In fact, David acts kinglier than the king in this moment. But David's faith is misunderstood by his brothers as self-interest. But after all, the Spirit of God is shaping David's destiny Something rose up within him when he saw this situation. He says, is there not a cause? This is not right. I I pray in this hour as the church, and here I want to get a little prophetic, that we have ears to hear what is right. I said to the men yesterday at the breakfast that Moses had been on the mountain for 40 days. And as he's up there, people are like, we don't know what's happened to him. Did he fall? Did he break his neck? We don't know what's happened to this Moses. That's what they began to say, and they began to make assumptions. They began to speculate. And since they don't know what's happened to their leader, in the vacuum of leadership, people speculate. And they make assumptions, and they contrive things, and they turn to another God. They turn to try to save themselves. Rather than wait for God's salvation, which is going to come through his word through Moses as he comes down the mountain, rather than wait for the word of God to come, they become impatient 
and get Aaron to make them a, a golden calf to worship. Why? Because as human beings, we crave certainty. And God sometimes leads us to places where we don't know what he's doing. But he wants us to trust him. As Moses is coming down the mountain, the Lord had spoken to Moses on the mountain and said, get down because the people are behaving corruptly. As Moses is coming down, Joshua meets him and he hears the same sounds that Moses is hearing. But he says, there's a sound of war in the camp. And Moses instructs Joshua and says, son, it's not the sound of war. It's not the sound of victory you're hearing. Or is it the sound of mourning for defeat? It's the sound of dancing. The people have corrupted themselves. Joshua did not have the discernment to understand what he was hearing because he didn't have the word. Moses is carrying the word. And when you're carrying the word, God can give you a discernment as to what sound. I pray we can hear the sound in the camp today. I'm going to leave that right there. Saul tried to give David the only identity he could understand, Try to put armor on David. But if your identity is not established, then your assignment will be limited. David knows who he is as a shepherd. I don't know who I am as a warrior, but I know who I am as a shepherd. Therefore, I know what to do as a shepherd. I got experience with this thing. Listen, the military people will tell you, you have a much better chance to win a battle if you can have a projectile than you do in close combat. David has a, a good weapon. But even with that weapon, it'll need God's guidance to hit its mark. Can you say amen? amen. But David had tested these things. He knew what he had in his sling. So David confronts Goliath as a shepherd not as a warrior general. He saw the whole conflict different than everybody else. The battle that everyone else ran from, David runs too. And it actually became the platform for his promotion. Think about it. Write this down. It took a David, it took a Goliath to reveal a David. It took a Goliath to reveal a David. And the situations and circumstances that you right now are facing are telling more to you about your identity as you go through it, as you confront it. What will you fight for? What will you walk away from? A man was asked, what do you think, who, what do you think is responsible for the way the culture is today? Is it ignorance or apathy? He said, I don't know and I don't care. That was a joke. You and I will be known for what we stood through, what we endured, what we confronted, what we overcame. As James says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Identity is what gives you access to your purpose. Recently, I went to the hospital to visit somebody a little, little while ago, earlier this year. And um, I went in, had my badge like I normally do, got my picture on it, keep it in my briefcase, went in, I get this. You can stop. <laughs> We've changed our security system. We need to verify your identity. So I took my badge off. She took it and put it in a drawer. <laughs> I felt naked. <laughs> without my badge. Because that identity is what gives me access to all the hospital, at least where the patients are that I'm going to see. Once my identity had been confirmed, I was permitted the fluidity that I needed to then get into the hospital. You know what? Some of us are still in the lobby. This is true for us in the spirit. If we don't have our identity properly established in Christ, we're going to be limited in being able to move with the spirit, fight with the Lord in the battles of the Lord. The old in our life doesn't leave just because you say, I'm tired of it. It only leaves when it's displaced by something new. 
The new in us starts with the way we speak to ourselves, what we say about ourselves, because the words we say to ourselves create our identity. David was known as a shepherd, but once he defeated Goliath, now he's known as something else. He's known as a warrior. And all of a sudden, people are singing. It's all over Instagram and Pinterest. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. A warrior. You know, Saul made a promise earlier that day. Whoever can beat this Goliath, he won't have to pay any more taxes, and I'm going to give him my daughter as his wife. It's 1 Samuel 17 in verse 25. You get my daughter, and you get to live tax-free. I mean, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> Tax-free, get the king's daughter. But when Saul went to give David his daughter in marriage, listen to what David says about himself. 1 Samuel 18, 23. I am a poor and lightly esteemed man. This man has just walked into the king's court with a head of a giant in his hand and Goliath's sword. And he says, I'm a lightly esteemed man. I'm a poor, lightly esteemed. David did not yet even still have the identity where he could see himself living in the king's palace, being the king's son-in-law, married to the king's daughter. He just killed Goliath. People are singing about his victories, tens of thousands, but David couldn't see it. What is going on? But the Spirit of God is working in David. Saul becomes jealous of David because of all the postings and all the thumbs up and all the singing and all the songs. And he tries to pin David to the wall two times with a spear until David then flees for his life. And then in 1 Samuel 25, 44, guess what Saul does? He reneges on his promise and he takes back his daughter that he had given to David and he gives David's wife to another man. This is intended to humiliate David, to embarrass him, to shock him, to block him. It's a form of public shaming to control him because, you see, Saul's significance is in his position. But David will grow in his significance as to who he is in relationship to God, the man after God's own heart. This is very different. We can't let embarrassing, even humiliating things that happen to us define who we are. Having someone take something from you that was yours can be very traumatic in your life. It's a whole different kind of identity theft through disappointment and the actions of others beyond your control. You start wondering who you are. And so David runs from David's, from Saul's presence, goes into the wilderness, and he will live in the wilderness as a hunted man for 10 years, a decade of his life. After having played in the king's court to soothe the king from a troubling spirit. Can I say this to you this morning, church? Don't let others define you by what they stole from you because you'll never transition into what God has for you if your perceived identity about yourself is not your identity that you receive from God. Saul's trying to define David as a usurper, tries to define David as disloyal, so David flees. We've got to be careful what we say to ourselves. Jeremiah in chapter 1 and verse 4 through 7, he says, well, I'm just a child. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child, he says. But the Lord said to me, do not say this. Some of you need to hear this this morning. There's things that you're saying to yourself, and the Lord is saying, stop saying that to yourself about yourself. Don't say that anymore. God's solution to Jeremiah was simple. Stop talking out of a false identity. Ask yourself, does God agree with everything I'm saying about myself right now? That I'm worthless, that I'm no good, that I'm not valued, that I'm not important? Sometimes God has to stop our words to shift our identity. Jeremiah, stop it. 
Proverbs 18, 14 says a man's spirit can endure sickness, but who can survive a broken spirit? Do you understand? Saul tried to break David's spirit. Take his wife. Accuse him of being a usurper. And while David is in the wilderness of Saul in pursuit, people even start believing these lies about him. So David being kind of the neighborhood watch group. He's got about 400 to 600 men with him now. And while they're in the wilderness, they're, they're kind of policing the area and they're protecting the people's farms. He's doing good deeds. He goes to this fellow named Nabal who's rich, has plenty to spare. And David and his men, David sends his men to ask, can you give us a little bit? We're hungry. And here's what Nabal says to David because he believed the lies. 1 Samuel 25, 10. Who is David? Who is this son of Jesse, 1 Samuel 25, 10? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread, my water, my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to the men who come from what I do not even know where they come from? And David's spirit melts when he hears this. And David said this, verse 21, same chapter, 25. In vain I've guarded that this fellow has in the wilderness. And done it in vain. So that nothing was missed that all belonged to him. He has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more. If by morning I leave one male man alive that belongs to him. I mean, David is hot and mad. But that kind of despair is the kind of despair and anger that can cause you to lose your identity. Forget who you are. David says, what does it matter? It's in vain I've done this. There'll be times in your life when you'll be tempted to think that what God called you to, what is it all good for? Not accomplishing anything here. You'll be tempted to think that. You will think it. And God does something very merciful for David. He sends him an Abigail. Constant hurt And disappointment, God knows, can callous our hearts. And we've got to be careful. And listen, these social media giants and moguls know it. They keep bombarding you and bombarding you with one purpose in mind. And they don't care about you. You're a user. What they care about is that you're watching all the advertising and they're making money off of you being a user. What they care about is to make your heart calloused. It's to callous your heart. Because whoever has your heart has you. David's heart is tempted to become callous here. Who, Ephesians 4, 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness and work uncleanness with greediness. But you have not learned Christ this way, Paul appeals to the Ephesians. Trauma, betrayal is meant to keep you from your assignment, your calling, to drag you away from your identity that God has put upon you. They're, those traumas are gateways to unreasonable fears that can limit you and drastically affect your decisions. As Paul told Timothy, you're not, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So God sends Abigail to David to help him recover his spirit. And here's what she says. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken to you and has appointed you prince over Israel, she knows who he is. She's got his identity down. My Lord, don't don't do this. Don't kill these people, David. Don't destroy them. Don't become a destroyer. My Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation for himself. Ah, this is the temptation all of us face, to work salvation for ourselves. I will avenge myself. You see, before you hit send on that hateful little email you contrived, (laughs) is that who you are? Is that who you are? Is that your identity? Is that how you learn Christ? Lost my place. here's what David says. You see, the Holy Spirit who rushed upon us seeks to remind us of our true calling. And David says to Abigail, 
Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. This is not David promising, okay, God, I'll be a good boy now. I'll be a good boy. I'll be a good boy. This is David being holy. Being good is not the same thing as being holy. Being holy is fearing God and not trying to save yourself. Respecting the work that God is doing in us. That's being holy. The fear of the Lord is what will bring you into open compensation with God. For some people, their biggest fear is what people think of them. It ought to be, what does God think about this? But there's still yet one more traumatic event. Can I have five more minutes? Hey, who can give me five more minutes? I'm s- that's an old preacher trick, 5, 10, 20, 30, you know. Yeah. No, I'll tell you. The flaps are down. Wheels are in position for a land. These are old preacher things. Okay, get ready to play, Paul. Come on to the keyboard, Paul. I like some music in the background. There's still yet one more traumatic event. Remember, trauma seeks to drag you away from who you are in Christ, to rob you of your identity. That's its intention. It's its purpose. So here's what David says. 1 Samuel 27, 1. Then David said in his heart. Said it in his heart. Oh. I know I'll perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than I should escape into the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. After 10 years of running, twice able to kill his enemy, and he says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. David gives in to his fears. He's lost his desire to dream anymore. The fact that he says, I can care less. I'm just going to go live with the Philistines now. I'm going to go to the world reveals just how much it still hurts what he's been through. When you know someone in your life says something like that, well, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to go. I'm just, no, They're just telling you how much it hurts. Just telling you how much it hurts. So David hid with the enemy. The enemy gives him the city Ziklag. It's a city in the enemy's territory. David's got his men there. See, God's not going to leave David alone, Paul. So an enemy comes and attacks the city. They burn it with fire. They take David's family, his wives. They take all their possessions of all the men that are following him. They take all of it. And when the men come, they see just embers and smoke and everything's gone. And at this moment, David's own men are thinking that, what have we been doing all these years? We've been following this guy and look what it's got us. And they're talking about killing David. But God has put his anointing upon David, marked him with significance. You might try to trade that for survival after some traumatic experience or betrayal or loss. (laughs) But God rushes in. God still pursues. Lurking beneath the ashes of that heartache is a dream that is still whispering. And so David cries out to the Lord. And the scripture says he encouraged himself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. And he says, Lord, shall we go and pursue them? God says, yes. Will we recover all? God says, yes. Church, don't let your faith be silenced by events you had no control over. This singular event helped prepare David for the throne. It's traumatic. It's dramatic. It's agonizing. People he thought were with him are about ready to leave him, kill him, nonetheless. But then in 2 Samuel, in a battle with the Philistines, David, Saul's, Saul, David's enemy, dies in battle along with his son Jonathan. And David becomes king in what is only first over Judah, only half the kingdom, less than half, 
anoints him king. And that started a civil war. <laughs> when does it end? He gets anointed king and then it starts a civil war. He had to learn to live with partial fulfillment. How many understand today as believers in this world that we live in a time of partial fulfillment? It's now and not yet the kingdom. The kingdom of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and as heaven. Yes, now, Lord. And God says, yes, it's now, but not so not yet. It's now and not yet. It's yes and no. It's now and will be. Can we live in that state of now and not yet? A lot more blood is shed, and David is finally in 2 Samuel 5, 3. The elders come in Hebron. They make David king. They make a covenant with them, and they anoint king over Israel. And this is when David says, and David knew. Oh, see all he's been through? And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people. David came to the place, listen to this church, don't miss it, where he saw himself as a uniter. Well, can I tell you that that's maturity. When you're a peace seeker, when you're a uniter, or even our gifts and callings, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints until we all come into the unity of the faith. God is a uniter. Until we see ourselves as God sees us, we can't recognize our true destiny. Our gifts and callings were given to us not to divide us, but to unite us. The church is the place you get to prove the love that you claim to have for God and for his people. And all the traumas and all the dramas and all the things you go through, God's always looking at the heart. Not your position. Not Ziklag. Not the battle. Not Goliath. Looking at you and the identity that you will respond out of. Listen, I close right here. Guarantee it. David perceived that God had made him king not to help himself or to make him feel significant, but to help Israel. That's it. Jesus did not leave heaven to help himself. He did not come to be served. He came to be a servant. He came to help us. Whatever God has given you is for the benefit of others. Our quest as disciples is not heaven. It is to be a person with God's heart, to be able to do whatever he calls us to do while avoiding the temptation to save ourselves and let rather his salvation come to us and through us. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Timothy, you preach the gospel. You keep on preaching. In doing so, here's what he said to Timothy, young pastor, you will not only save yourself, but you will save all those that hear you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Oh, God, what a blessing that your Holy Spirit has rushed upon us, that your spirit dwells within us, that you have given us a new identity in Christ, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, or there is a new creation. You have made us, and not we ourselves. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the glory may be seen to be of you and not of us. God, I pray today, Lord, we live in a world where so many are seeking their significance in the wrong places. They're trying to find their significance, their identity in pronouns, and behaviors or activities or through their social media or through where they live or what they buy or how much or how little. And in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that spirit would just be broken. 
Break that spirit. It's ruining lives. Significance is being exploited everywhere we look. When, God, you have met our greatest need in Christ, you have told us, God, that we're your child, that we're adopted. Heaven's not our goal. It's our inheritance. We're in the family now. Hallelujah. You're not at the top of some ladder that we have to climb. You became the ladder that, Lord, we could become one with you. Oh, God, we thank you. How rich is your mercy. How wonderful is your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, do me another favor. If you read those chapters, open up Psalm 89. Listen to the covenant, what's known as the sure mercies of David, the covenant that God makes with David. I mean, it's amazing, Psalm 89. And then claim that for yourself as well. Hallelujah. Because it's, it's true for all those who are seeking God's heart. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Praise your wonderful name. Oh, I am? Okay. I'll do that. Are they here? Yeah. The women's ministry is being prayed for today. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's got to change my mind. <laughs> All right. What was I doing? He said we're excited to be able to pray over the women's ministry. Why don't you come do that, honey? <laughs> Gosh, I just preached my heart out. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're excited yeah, get... to be able to pray over the women's ministry today. Um, Pastor called for prayer. And then Nicole's here. Is Amy around with you? I don't think Amy's here today. No, she's out of town. I think let's wait. I think I'm going to wait. We're going to wait. pray for y'all together. We're going to pray for the deacons, I think, in September, and it would be a good time to. No, you're okay, Brother Renee. Thank you. You're good. We can wait, right? We can wait. Yeah. Yeah, we can all wait. Hey, where was I? Dismissing you. That's right. If you need prayer this morning, yes, let's not forget this, because there may be some today who need prayer. Our altar workers, please come and at this time, be, be here so people can see that they're not walking up to an empty place. And uh, if you need prayer this morning, let me pray for you as we go. In Jesus' name, God, bless your people today, God. We thank you, Lord, for who we are in Christ Jesus. Let us reflect you, God, onto this world as we go about our lives, as we go about doing, God, the things that you have called us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you for your forbearance this morning. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Living Rock Sermons. We hope that today's sermon has left a lasting impact on your heart and spirit. If you'd like to connect with Living Rock more, we invite you to visit our website, living-rock.org. There you can find information about our upcoming services, current events, and all of our ministries. Whether you're based in Killingworth, Connecticut, near the shoreline, or anywhere around the world, we welcome you to join our vibrant community. Stay connected with us on social media to receive daily inspiration, updates, and engaging content. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and you can find us on YouTube as well. We're here to support you on your faith journey, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or prayer requests. Thank you again for tuning in. As we continue to grow together in faith, may God's love and grace fill your life abundantly. Until next time, take care and may you find strength and peace in his presence.